We ask that the comfort of the Holy Spirit may come in his fullness and abide with us, help us to understand this lesson we're going to study today, give clarity to our thoughts and my, our understanding so that we can see how this applies to us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So today we are going to cover the early and the latter rain. The early and the latter rain. Uh, to cover. Um, the early and the latter rain are Bible expressions that speak about the work of the Holy Spirit in the two phases of the history of the church. Um, it's expressions that are written um, to God's people because God, the, the way the Bible is written, it is, has a lot of agricultural imagery. So the agricultural imagery will help you understand a lot of biblical narratives that are happening there. So if we go to the next slide, um, we discover something very interesting, which is uh, the agricultural historical background to the concept of early and latter rain. Um, in the book of James chapter five, verse seven, um, if, if we just turn our Bibles there and read it, James chapter 5, verse 7. The Bible says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and the latter rain. So the Bible is very clear here that uh, the husbandman is a farmer, uh, he waits for the fruit of the earth. In other words, for harvest, and before he gets harvest, he receives two types of rain. He receives the early, or the rain that comes first, and then he also receives the latter, the latter rain. So that is the patience of a farmer, is the patience we need to manifest. But the main point is that before harvest in Palestine, there were two key rains that the Bible speaks about that are very important, that are used as an illustration of the Holy Spirit. And uh, when we go to Jeremiah 5, verse 24, um, Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 24, we find also that the early and the latter rain are very important before there's harvest. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 24. It says, neither say they in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God that giveth rain, both the former and the latter in his season. He reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of harvest. So here, God is the one who brings the rain. The former, the other expression for former is early rain and also the latter. So you have the early and the latter rain. Both of them are needed for there to be harvest. So this is very, very important. And these two rains play a key important role in terms of preparing the seeds, the ground, and the plants for germination. So, and uh, God uses this so that he can help us understand the illustrations better. So if you go to uh, Psalm 65, Psalm 65 verse nine and turn, uh, we find the purpose of this early rain. Um, what is the purpose of the early rain? Psalm 65, verse 9 and 10. The Bible says, Thou visitest the earth and waterest it. Thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God, which is full of water. Thou preparest them corn when thou hast so provided for it. Thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly, thou settlest the furrows thereof, thou makest it soft with the showers, thou blessest the spring in thereof. So in verse 10, we see the watering of God being the rain that basically softens the furrows. The furrow is what the farmers make or the husbandman makes when he's plowing. So the rain's purpose is to soften the ground and cause the seed to spring up. And the rain that basically does that is the early rain. Early rain is the one that softens the ground before the seed is planted and then the seed germinates. And um, 
And after the seed germinates, of course, using the parable of Jesus in Matthew, Mark chapter 4, 28, the seed germinates first the blade, then the ear, and after that, the full corn in the ear. Um, so, and all this takes place under what the Bible calls the former or the early rain. So it doesn't fall in one day. It's a season. It takes a period of time where the early rain falls. It causes the seed to germinate um, and causes the plant to grow, causes the plant to bear fruit. And then that's where the early rain stops. Then the latter rain comes a little bit later for other developments. So let's move on to the next slide. So last day events 183, Ellen White says, in the East, the former rain falls at the sowing time. It is necessary in order that the seed may germinate under the influence of the fertilizing showers, the tender shoot springs up. So Ellen White here is making the same point I was making earlier on, that uh, you have this early rain that causes the seed to germinate and uh, causes the plant to grow and causes the plant to bear fruit. That's very important. All that uh, happens uh, through the influence of the early rain. So we go to the next chart, which is in the next slide. We find that the early rain started falling around fall time. That was the time when they were started sowing in autumn or in the fall. Uh, so the early rain's purpose would be to soften the ground, as you see in the slide. The soil is prepared for sowing. The seed is sown and the seed germinates and then the plant grows. So you have that. So that is the work of the early rain, basically to cause the seed to germinate, uh, to bear fruit and um, to grow. So we're moving on now. We understand the purpose of the early rain. Now we can move on to the purpose of the latter rain uh, in the illustration, the agricultural background. The latter rain usually falls in greater abundance than the early rain. Joel chapter 2 verse 23. Let's turn our Bibles there. Joel chapter 2 verse 23. We find um, God here speaking about, I mean, Joel here speaking about the latter rain. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he had given you the former rain moderately. What is the former rain? The early rain. And then the Bible says, and it will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first, first month. So you have this, um, the moderation is in the early rain. Uh, the latter rain falls in great abundance. Um, so that is what we see here. And what is the purpose of the latter rain? Once the early rain has caused the seed to germinate. It has caused it to bear fruit. The latter rain's work is to ripen uh, what is there. It's just to ripen. Its purpose is to ripen and prepare the fruit for harvest. So that's, that's very important. Uh, that's why it says in verse 24, still in Joel chapter 2, verse 24, it says, The floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats overflow with wine and oil. So here the Bible mentions wheat, and then it mentions wine, which comes from grapes, and oil, which comes from olives. So all these are the three different types of plants. All of them have to have early rain and latter rain, so that uh, you can have harvest. You'll find the same thing in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 14. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 14 you have a similar illustration there. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 14. The Bible says that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn, thy wine, and thy oil. So the Bible here speaks about the first rain or the early rain or the former rain. It's the same rain. It's just used, um, it's the first one that the farmers have to go through. And the latter one is the last one just before harvest. So that is very, very important. So the purpose of this early rain is basically ripen the crop, prepare it for harvest. And uh, there's a specific season for the latter rain 
and there's a specific season for the early rain. And in Zechariah chapter 10, verse 1, we find that this rain, the latter rain, is a very interesting rain because there's a time for it. And uh, biblically speaking, the time for the latter rain begins in the spring. The time for the early rain begins in the fall. So you have, uh, you have that. So the book of Zechariah chapter 10, uh, verse 1. Zechariah chapter 10, verse 1. Ask ye, the, ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to everyone grass in the field. So here you have um, uh, a request that in the time of the latter rain, you need to pray so that the Lord can pour out rain specifically for that. And uh, you go to the book of Songs of Solomon, you get the picture that the latter rain starts falling in the spring. And uh, this is very important because when the Bible uses an illustration, one of the key important aspects of studying the Bible is to study the illustration in its fullness so that you understand it clearly before you start applying it. So let's move on to the next slide. The latter rain, falling near the close of the season, ripens the grain and prepares it for the sickle. The Lord employs these operations of nature to represent the work of the Holy Spirit. So these two rains, according to Ellen White, last the event 23, they represent the work of the Holy Spirit in two different phases of the history of the church. It's just called latter rain and early rain to try and depict what work the Holy Spirit will be doing at what time period uh, during the time when the church is in, going through, the trials is going through. So let's move on to the next one. So this is what I've been saying. You can see it in a chart format. The early rain softens the ground. The soil is prepared for sowing. The seed is sown. The seed germinates and then the plant grows. All this happens under the early rain. So the early rain continues to fall. In the fall, continues. And uh, by the time winter comes, the rain stops. And then in the spring, you have the latter rain beginning to fall. And it falls in great abundance. And as the latter rain falls, it ripens the already fruit that were born under the early rain. And it prepares the fruit for harvest. And um, as you can see in the chart there, I have a ceiling. And what the farmers used to do in, um, in Palestine was that after the latter rain had fallen and the crops had ripened, the first crops to ripen were sealed because there were certain feasts that required first fruits to be offered to the Lord. We have the, first, the feast of the first fruits, if you study the agricultural model that happened on the, on the first day, just after the day of 11, I mean, after the day of um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the day after, you have the Feast of the Wave Sheep. You also have the Feast of Pentecost, where the first fruits had to be offered to the Lord. So how will they know what fruit is the first? They had to wait for the early rain to fall, and then also wait for the latter rain to ripen the crop. And once the latter rain has ripened the crop, then the farmer would walk in the field and then tie a red robe around the crops that have ripened first. And that would be called the first fruits. And that's what we call sealing. So you would seal, 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 or mark the crops that needed, that were the first ones to ripen. Then after that, when the harvest comes, those first ones to ripen are the ones that are harvested. And then they are presented before the Lord as a wave shift. So this is agricultural model is very important to understand before we apply it in the end of time. And then you have the harvest. Um, the harvest happened in the summer. Um, and that's when they had their harvest and they harvest everything. So this is a picture of the history of God's church from the time of the apostles until the end of time. While we're still here in this chart, I just wanted to connect everything for you. So the early rain, we understand this from the Bible, and we'll see the Bible verses. It started falling in the book of Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we find the fall 
X chapter 1 and chapter 2, preparation in X chapter 1. X chapter 2, we find uh, on the day of Pentecost, we find the beginning of the fall of the early rain. So this rain did not just fall in X chapter 2. As you will see in the slides, it also fell in X chapter 4, X chapter 5, X chapter 10. It continued to fall at different time periods of the church. Continued to fall even in the midnight cry of the time of Ellen White. Even in our time, the early rain is still falling. So, and uh, this early rain represents the church of God, uh, represents the Holy Spirit working in the church of God during this time period. And as you can see, you have four seasons. So there's a biblical season, as it were, that will help you understand this. So the fall would represent the time when the church began with the apostolic period. Then they went through the winter period. The winter period will represent the time of the dark ages uh, when the, the crops seem to be very dry going through the winter season and the snow season of the cold winters or persecution during the dark ages. And then you have the spring in time, the time when you have um, the beginning of the rise of truth that is being made much more clearer, uh, especially after the Millerite movement uh, with the movement of um, more magnification of the present truth and the truth that God had presented to us being magnified much more clearer, made to us. And then you have the sealing, which is going to take place a little bit later on, as we'll see when we study the seal and the mark. And then you have the harvest. The harvest is the second coming. You can find this evidence that the ha this harvest takes place at the second coming. Revelation chapter 14, you will have Christ having a sequel to harvest the crops of the earth. So, and when you tie this with the parable in Matthew chapter 24, you'll find that Christ speaks about his coming as taking place in the summer. Not in the season of summer, but in the biblical summer season. Um, it speaks about the, the figs that will be ready for harvest in the summer and likens that to his second coming. So I just wanted to give you this overview of the illustration and then you have this connection so that it's much more clearer. I'll be coming back to this graph more and more. So now let's move on to the next slide. So now let's study this uh, from the Bible. The time of the early rain, when did the early rain fall? We already read Joel chapter 2, verse 23 and 24, which spoke about the early and the latter rain. And that that rain represented the Holy Spirit. We'll find that in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. I will quickly read that one. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And upon the servants and upon the handmaids, and in those days I'll pour out my spirit, and I'll show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. I just read verse 30 also. So you have the prophecy of the early and the latter rain being depicted as the Holy Spirit here in this uh, Joel chapter 2. When we couple this with Acts chapter 2, we go to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, we find a very interesting um, fulfillment of this prophecy as given by Peter in Acts chapter 2. <coughs> Excuse me. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judah, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken as he supposed, seeing that it is but the third hour of the day, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, said the Lord, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. So what we have here is um, that we have the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy, partial fulfillment in Joel chapter 2. And uh, we are still going to find uh, another fulfillment because it says in the last days, do you believe that um, um, Peter and all the apostles were living the last days? Not necessarily, not in the last days as we have it now, 
So uh, the last days here has a dual application, the last days before the destruction of Jerusalem, as well as the last days before the end of the world. So you have that dual application there. Then that is when the early rain started falling. So the Holy Spirit there is depicted. In Acts chapter 431, I won't read it. It's another outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the Jews. Acts chapter 10, verse 44 to 48, you have the outpouring of the Spirit on the Gentiles. So it's still the early rain. It's still the work of the Holy Spirit under the early rain power. That's why Ellen White says in Acts of the Apostles, page 54 and 55. The outpouring of the Spirit in the days of the Apostles was the beginning of the early or the former rain, and glorious was the result. To the end of time, the presence of the Spirit is to abide with the true church. So, so you have this Acts of the Apostles, page 54 and 55. So the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is the beginning of the early reign. We have that very, very clear from the Bible, as well as from the spirit of prophecy. So let's now move on to the next slide. What is the time of the latter reign? Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 3, verse 19 and 20. So you have the time of the, um, the latter reign, Acts chapter 3, uh, during the sermon that Peter gave. In verse 19, it says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So here Peter uses the concept of times of refreshing as coming from the presence of the Lord. Then verse 20 says, And he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you. So you have... Uh, we need to repent, be converted, so that our sins can be blotted out when? When the times of refreshing shall come. If you study the Bible very carefully, the times of refreshing is another expression for the latter rain. The latter rain will come a little bit later, just before the second coming. That's why it says in verse 20, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Before the second coming, you will have that time of refreshing in which there will be the outpouring of the latter rain. So Joel chapter 2 also is very clear that the outpouring of the Spirit is going to take place in the last days upon young men, upon young women, upon old and young. So the little children, the old people are also going to receive um, this latter rain, the Holy Spirit uh, in the form of latter rain. And this latter rain in the end of time is going to be the one that gives power to something that we call the loud cry or the preaching of the three angels' messages throughout the whole world. If you go to Revelation chapter 18, verse 1 and 2, Revelation 18, verse 1 and 2. <clears throat> And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his, with his glory. So there's an angel here. He's flying in the midst of heaven, and he has great power, and the earth is lightened with his glory. We're going to study this verse when we talk about the loud cry. But we know very well, according to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus Christ said, but you shall receive power. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses of me both in Jerusalem and Judea and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Power comes through the work of the Holy Spirit. So when this angel has great power, in other words, he represents God's people who will be empowered by the mighty work of the Holy Spirit under the latter rain power. So this will become clearer as we move on to the next slide. Let's move on. Thank you. So the timing of the latter rain. So Ellen White is very specific when the latter rain is going to fall or when it will start falling in its abundance. Early writings, page 85 and 86. The commencement of that time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plague shall begin to be poured out, but to a short period just before they are poured out while Christ is in the sanctuary. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming upon the earth, and the nations will be angry, yet held in check so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. At that time, the latter rain 
or the refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Remember Acts chapter 3? She says, latter rain or refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come to give power to the loud voice of the third angel and prepare the saints to stand in the period when the seven last plagues shall be poured out. So she's very clear that it is at the time when there's the little time of trouble when the latter rain is going to fall. And this little time of trouble begins through Sunday laws, as you will see very, very clearly with time. So as we continue, before the work is closed up and the sealing of God's people is finished, we shall receive the outpouring of the Spirit of God. So that is Selected Messages, Book 1, page 111, paragraph 9. And then Great Controversy 464, before the final visitation of God's judgment upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The spirit and the power of God will be poured upon his children. So here she's telling us that just before the second coming of Christ, there will be such a revival of primitive godliness that will come as a result of the work of the Holy Spirit in our time. So that you follow clearly what I'm saying, let's move on to the next slide so that we can see the chart that will help us understand these things. We are able to continue. Um, so we are in the slide that speaks about the early and the latter rain, the timing of the latter rain. We spoke about the early rain beginning in the time of Pentecost, as you can see in the chart. You are from Pentecost um, up to even after the National Sunday Law, there will still be um, some latter rain that will be falling then, especially in the first two phases of the Sunday Law, up to the third phase. So you have that early rain, that will be the time of the early rain. And then the latter rain starts falling when the National Sunday Law um, has been enacted and it starts increasing in its magnitude until you have the close of probation. And it is during the time when the little time of trouble is taking place. Uh, between the National Sunday Law, the NSL, there's the National Sunday Law and the close of probation. That will be the time when the latter rain will be falling. And as you can see in the chart, I have on top of the, the time of the latter rain, and we have it beginning in 1888. So some of you are familiar with our history in 1888, like you saw in the National uh, Sunday Law class, we talked about the Sunday Law movement of the 1800s, um, where there was a push for Sunday Law in 1888. Not only was there a push for Sunday Law in 1888, but there was also a message of righteousness by faith that was preached by um, A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. Not only was that the case, but Ellen White commenting on that message, message of righteousness by faith, said something very interesting, um, as you see in the statements just next to, to the chart. Said, my guide, there is much light yet to shine forth from the law of God and the gospel of righteousness. This message understood in its true character and proclaimed in the spirit will lighten the earth with its glory. And then coming down to the next statement, she says, the light that is to lighten the whole earth with its glory was resisted and by the action of our own brethren has been in a great degree kept away from the world. So that light of the message of righteousness by faith was rejected according to Ellen White. And it is the same message was, that was to lighten the whole earth with its glory. There are other statements where she spoke about the fact that um, the latter rain fell. Uh, it was beginning to fall when A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner were preaching the message of righteousness by faith. But the Lord had to suspend it because the people are not ready to take it forward. So that, that is why we have that. So... Based on inspiration, after 1888, most of the statements of Ellen White, 1897, she says, we are now living in the time of the latter rain. So ever since then, even up to now, this is the time when the latter rain can fall at any moment. What we are communicating is that 
the Sunday law could pass at any time after it need be. And uh, whenever the Sunday law is being enacted, then the latter in its fullness is going to fall uh, on the church to empower them to give the loud cry. So moving on to the next slide, um, so that you can see everything in its clarity, you have number one there, you have five uh, circles on top, you have Pentecost, then you have 844, then you have 888, then you have the National Sunday Law, and then you have the close of probation. So those are the, the columns that we have divided this chart with. So then you have number one, which is the early rain. It started falling in Pentecost. It will continue even up to the little time of trouble. This is the same work of the Holy Spirit that is happening there. And then <clears throat> the next one is the seal of the Holy Spirit. I'll talk about it when I talk about the seal and the mark. And then you have the preliminary loud cry and the final loud cry. Uh, people are preaching the three angels' messages now. We call it the preliminary loud cry. But when the three angels' messages will be preached after the Sunday law, it's going to swell into a loud cry. Then we're coming down to number four. You have this frustrated latter rain. The latter rain that wanted to come, people are not ready. Um, and then you have the latter rain in fullness coming after the Sunday law. Then you have the preliminary seal, and then you have the eternal seal. Um, and then come down to number six, the closing of the heavenly sanctuary. And then number seven, judgment of the dead. And then after Sunday, law, the judgment of the living, that the blood and out of sin. That we'll also try to talk about when we get time. So this is the chat by Gordon Collier, senior. So let's move on to the next slide. Number four, you have the latter rain that was falling in sprinkles in 888. Then because the church, then because the church was not ready, um, the latter rain was withheld by God. There was a question from Kim. How do we know that the judgment of the living begin once the Sunday law is uh, set? Um, that will become clear after I cover the seal and the mark. But just a brief response would be that, um, according to the Bible, God judges us based on what is written in the books. Um, so God allows you to live your life and make your last decision. And then after you've made your last decision, that's when the judgment is going to come to you. So the dead people, when you die, you best can close your probation. So that's why the judgment begins with the dead. And then for it to come to the living, the living, the living have to reach a point where they will make a decision, a decision that will be permanent, that will seal their destiny for God or against God. It's only after that decision has been made, after they have had all the evidences presented to them, that is when their names will be called and then their judgment will take place. And during the Sunday law crisis, that period is going to come where everybody will have to either receive the mark of the beast or the seal of God. And once you have received either, your destiny is sealed. It's only when you're de after your destiny is sealed that you, the judgment can come to your name. So, but I just wanted to give that brief um, response. Um, that's why we put it in general there, because that is when the world was going to be grouped into two groups that are going to make their final decision for God or against God. But that's a very okay. Deal with it. Can I ask a quick question, Logan? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. I, I really agree with that. Um, so in, the, in essence, we, we basically close our own probation based upon the decision we make about the mark versus the seal, correct? That's right. But that will be clear when, yeah, I'm there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes. you. Okay. Okay, then one, one more question. Why do we hear so many people say that the Seventh-day Adventist probation will be closed at the Sunday Law. I've heard that from a couple different people. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard that, but is there any anything written that, that kind of alludes to that? 
Yeah, there are some statements that seem to allude to that, but uh, I, I will deal with it. There's a study we will deal with close of probation. It's such an important study that I believe okay. everybody needs to understand very, very well. So I would rather defer that, this question to that study. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the next one. The purpose of the early rain. Uh, in our slides. Um, the early rain is such, plays such a critical role in our salvation, uh, such that without the early rain, and we, we cannot receive the latter rain. So this is very, very important. Just like in the agricultural model, without the early rain to soften the ground, cause the seed to germinate, there's nothing to ripen when the latter rain comes. And um, so the role of the latter rain, I mean, the early rain is to basically convert us. The conversion experience is likened to the seed that begins to germinate in an individual capacity. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 11 makes that very clear that the Holy Spirit is the one who resurrects us from dead works. Conversion is the work of the Holy Spirit. He's the one that creates a new heart in us. And then he, the same Holy Spirit, is the one that crucifies the old man, according to Romans chapter 8 and also chapter 6, in us, so that our life is a life of victory. And uh, it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that we gain victory over our defects of character. And that's why Ellen White says in Testimonies, Volume 5, 214, not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot or stain upon them. That's very interesting. The seal of God will not come upon us while we have one spot or stain. Then she says, it is left with us to remedy the defects in our characters. To cleanse the soul temple of every defilement then the latter rain will fall upon us as the early rain fall upon the disciples from the day of Pentecost. So this work of purification of character, the Lord has left with us, but he has not left with us alone. <clears throat> there are several statements I could have attached here that speak about the work of the Holy Spirit as the one who does the purification, as the one who does the cleansing. So it is his work to do that kind of work in our hearts. So not only that, but John 16, 13 tells us that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. Um, if you read that chapter and deserve ages, let not your heart be troubled. Uh, Ellen White gives more detail about the Holy Spirit. He's the one who teaches us to know about God. And he's the one who teaches us his will for our lives. He's the one who helps us to know and reminds us of the sins we have committed. And helps to expose to us character weaknesses so that we can correct them. So he, it is his purpose to define truth, to guide us into all truth, to lead us to experience truth, and to help us to settle into truth. So this is his work, the work of the Holy Spirit in the early, early rain phase. And then to cleanse us, to rid us of every hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil, to rid us of every propensity um, um, to sin. The refreshing, the latter rain of power of God comes only on those who have prepared themselves for it by doing the work which God bids them, namely cleansing themselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. I saw that none could share the refreshing unless they obtained the victory over every besetment, over pride, selfishness, love of the world, and over every wrong word and action. Many times when I read the statements, I guess, get chills on my back. It's like, who's going to be saved? But what's so encouraging about this is that God is there. God, the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit who Christ had. I mean, Christ was full of the Holy Spirit. Like I usually ask some of my students in class, do we have different Holy Spirit or is just the same one? They would say it's the same one. If the Holy Spirit came into Christ's human body and kept him from sinning all throughout the 33 years of his life 
then you have the same Holy Spirit. Do you believe that if you really yielded to him every moment of your life, you would do the same thing in your life? Definitely you would. It's the same Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that helped Paul, according to Ellen White, reach the same measure and stature, the fullness of Christ. Uh, the same Holy Spirit who helped Daniel to live a blameless life. The same Holy Spirit who helped Job to live a life that is perfect. It's the same Holy Spirit who's available now. And it's not like a different Holy Spirit. His God is powerful. He has done that already in the past with human beings. He can still do the same uh, if we just let him in our lives. It says, may the Lord help his people to cleanse the soul temple from every defilement and to maintain such a close connection with him that they may be partakers of the latter rain when it shall be poured out. So what we will notice here is that the latter rain converts us, gives us a complete victory, cleanses us, purifies us. And let's move on to the next slide. And um, purify the vessel so that we can receive the latter rain. So the purpose of the early rain is really to cleanse, purify, and helps us to get the fruits of the Spirit. Today you are to have your vessel purified that it may be ready for the heavenly dew, ready for the showers of the latter rain. But the latter rain will come, and the blessing of God will fill every soul that is purified from every defilement. It is our work today to yield our souls to Christ, that we may be fitted for the time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord fitted for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Revere Herald, March 22, 1892. We need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit in Lateran power, but that cannot come unless we have experienced the early rain. The early rain needs to come. And we really need to experience true conversion. We need to cooperate with the Holy Spirit who is revealing to us defects in our characters, stains in our lives, and yield them to him and ask him to help us to overcome. <clears throat> And then this early rain is very important. Uh, it's a necessary prerequisite to receive in the latter rain. Unless the former rain has fallen, there will be no life. The green blade will not spring up. Testimonies to ministers 506. Unless the early showers have done their work, <coughs> excuse me, the latter rain can bring no seed to perfection. So, so if you don't receive the early rain now, there is no way you will receive the latter rain. It's impossible. So this that's why this study is such so so important. And if you don't have the early rain or the latter rain, there's no way you will survive the deceptions that are coming. It's impossible for sinners without the aid of the God to overcome one sin. So in that it comes through the work of the Holy Spirit. So, and then the next point is to bring us to full maturity of character as far as sin is concerned, to restore us to the perfection of Adam before his fall. Um, Maranatha, Ellen White tells us that if we yield our will to God, we may reach the state of sinlessness in which Adam was before his fall. And this is character perfection. It's not human perfection is not nature perfection. That is not possible until second coming. But character perfection is what we are talking about. To prepare us to stand the test of the National Sunday Law. So these are the purposes of the early rain. So the, as you can see, the early rain is so, so important. And he is the one that is fallen now, is the one that is convicting us of sin, is the one that is working in our characters. We need to yield to him so that he can work in us a pure character, so that we are ready to receive the latter rain. And what is now the purpose of the latter rain then? Um, the latter rain, remember its work, is to ripen the fruits that are already there. You can have an apple tree with apples, like we have in apple trees in our farm at, uh, in our ministry. So you see, during the early parts, early seasons, there is the early rain, there's the apples, but the apples are not ripened. But then there's the latter rain that comes and it just falls in large abundance. And then the apples get sweetened, sweetened, 
and they get ripened and then they are ready for harvest. That is the purpose of the latter rain. And not only that, but it's more. To fully ripen harvest, to bring God's people to full maturity of character. Um, as the dew and the rain are given first to cause the seed to germinate and then to ripen the harvest. <coughs> Excuse me. So the Holy Spirit is given to carry forward from one stage to another, the process of spiritual growth. It's very important here to emphasize uh, spiritual growth from one stage to another. The ripening of the grain represents the completion of the work of God's grace in the soul. That's very important. When we talk about a ripened grain, what are we talking about? We are talking about when the grace of God has completed its work in your soul. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the moral image of God is to be perfected in the character. We are to be wholly transformed into the likeness of Christ. Revelation how old? March 2, 8, 9, 7. So you compare this with Revelation 14. It speaks about, excuse me, it speaks about the earth being fully ripe. It meant that uh, God's people fully bear the likeness of Christ, character of Christ. Um, that's why Ellen White said, when the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in his people, then will come and claim them as his own. So, and that perfect reproduction of character of Christ in its perfectness, in its completeness, in its mature sense, is the work of the latter reign. Uh, he's the one that completes that. And then to prepare God's people for sealing, when the decree National Sunday Law goes forth and the stamp is impressed, the seal of God, their character will remain pure and spotless for eternity. Uh, the seal of God will come upon those whose character is as spotless. The despised remnant are clothed in glorious apparel, um, no more to be defiled by the corruptions of the world. Now they are eternally secure from the tempter's devices. Holy angels and sin were passing to and fro, placing upon them the seal of the living God. So you can see the despised remnant um, clothed in glorious apparel, and um, they are ready for the crisis ahead. And then the angels go and place upon them the seal of the living God. So the lot terrain prepares them, equips them, imprints the character of God in their hearts, in their minds, in their character. That Nothing else is going to remove it, even during the great time of trouble. To empower God's people to give the loud cry. That's the third purpose of the latter rain. At that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming upon the earth, and the nations will be angry, yet held in check, as so as not to prevent the work of the dead angel. At that time, the latter rain or refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come to give power to the loud voice of the dead angel. Sorry for that a typo. Uh, will come to give power to the loud voice of the third angel. So we're moving on to the next slide. Um, purpose number four of the latter rain, to prepare God's people for the time of trouble. It is the latter rain which revives and strengthens them to pass through the time of trouble. Just Simone's volume one, three, five, three. It revives and strengthens them to pass through the time of trouble. Without the latter rain, no saint will make it through the time of trouble. None. So the latter rain is critical for us to have it. At that time, the little time of trouble, the latter rain or refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come to prepare the saints to stand in the period when the seven last plagues are poured out. Early writings, 85 and 86. And as you will learn in our class, when the seven last plagues are poured out, probation is already closed. Jesus has already moved between us and God, and we are standing before him without a mediator. And we'll only need the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, in lateral power, to be able to stand. The work of this angel comes in at the right time to join the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. And the people of God are thus prepared to stand in the hour of temptation, which they are soon to meet. Hello writings 277. And then the fifth uh, purpose of the latter reign is to prepare God's people for the second coming of Jesus. 
but near the close of earth's harvest a special bestowal of spiritual graces promised to prepare the church for the coming of the son of man acts of the apostles page 55 the latter rain ripening at harvest represents the spiritual grace that prepares the church for the coming of the Son of Man. Testimonies to Ministers 506. So the latter rain prepares us for the second coming of Jesus. Let's look at the last two purposes of the latter rain before we move on to the next thing. Um, to prepare God's people, this is in the next slide, for the finishing touch of immortality. Those who come to every point, I like this statement, and stand every test and overcome, be the prize what it may, have heeded the counsel of the true witness, and they will receive the latter rain and thus be ready for translation. So the latter rain here prepares us for translation. Testimonies 101, 187. Those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble must reflect the image of Jesus fully. Then, are we together? Yes. Okay. That neglected the needful preparation, therefore they could not receive the refreshing that all must have to fit them to live in the sight of a holy God. A very interesting statement to prepare us to look and live in the face of God, the latter rain. Um, so, so it's important here to make the distinction very clear that the early rain helps us to reach that perfect character. The latter rain has a way, Ellen White puts it in a nicer way. She says, uh, this latter rain removes the earthliness from us, you know, and um, I like uh, what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, that when Christ is coming to take the church, is going to take it without spot or stain or any wrinkle. You know, when you're doing your laundry, you can remove all the stains. The robe is spotless, but it just needs that final ironing that will render it uh, you know ready uh not spot nor any wrinkle that expression and otherwise this is until the earthliness is removed it's talking about the effect of the work of the latter rain and also the great time of trouble when these two combine they remove the earthliness from us and also the work of the latter rain is to help god's people to stand before god without a mediate and that needs a lot of supernatural power especially given what God's people are going to go through. So let's see if we can finish on time. <coughs> the early and the latter rain, preparation for the early rain. If I want the Holy Spirit in early rain power, what do I do? Um, I will not have time to read the verses. I think you can read it in your own time. A thorough wholehearted repentance. Um, so Hosea chapter 6 is telling us to um, repent and come unto the Lord and return unto the Lord our God and he will hear us and he will be the one that leads us in the path of righteousness and when you go to the book of Joel chapter 2 it speaks about the importance of repentance and confession of sin before they receive the early and the latter rain and that was also the experience of the disciples in Acts chapter 1 and Ellen White gives us more insight about how the disciples prepared themselves for the early reign in Acts chapter 1. And uh, she comments this in Acts of the Apostles, page 37. These days of preparation were days of deep heart searching. The disciples felt their spiritual need and cried to the Lord for the holy unction that was to fit them for the work of soul saving. So you can see they were really searching their hearts. And I believe this is the time for us to really search our hearts and ask the Lord to help us and see our spiritual need and fill our hearts. Number two, while living upon, excuse me, while living up to all known light, we are to pray and to seek for more light. 
So the apostles continue to pray and they also continue to study the scriptures in Acts chapter 1 verse 20 and Acts chapter 1 verse 12 to 15. Um, they were praying together, studying the Bible together and in number three, earnestly seek for the complete and broken victory over all sin. Uh, Acts of the Apostles, page 37. As they meditated upon his pure holy life, they felt no toil would be too hard, no sacrifice too great, if only they could bear witness in their lives to the loveliness of Christ's character. They took a lot of time dwelling on the life of Christ, especially the closing ones. Uh, they spent a lot of time studying that, and I have tried it before. It's such a rewarding experience. The next slide. They were zealous to be about the Father's business. They were working for souls, and that was also a preparation they needed. Acts of the Apostles, page 37. The disciples prayed with intense earnestness for a fitness to meet men in their daily intercourse, to speak words that would lead sinners to Christ. So they were praying for the Lord to give them the words to share with other people. They did not ask for a blessing for themselves merely. They were weighted with a burden of the salvation of souls. They realized that the gospel was to be carried to the world, and they claimed the power that Christ had promised. Acts of the Apostles, page 37. So they were weighted with the burden of the salvation of souls. They had this heavy burden, and they were praying for the Lord to give them power to do his work. And as they dwelt on the life of Christ, like a procession, sin after sin of his wonderful life passed before them. They wholeheartedly accepted all the teachings of God with no excuses, no justification, no rationalizing. They yielded their lives completely to God. That's how they prepared. So, and then, in the remaining few minutes, I'm going to finish up this presentation with how to prepare for the latter rain. How to prepare for the latter rain. There are just seven points, and then we'll be done. Point number one, a converted people receive abundantly of the early rain. Uh, actually, these two points I'm going to repeat again in the seven conditions of receiving the latter rain. So due to time, I'm going to skip this slide. And um, then let's move on to the next one, which is the condition of uh, for receiving the latter rain. Yes, the seven points start here. Who will receive the latter rain? Number one, an enlightened people. The great outpouring of the Spirit of God, which lightens the earth with his glory, will not come until we have an enlightened people. <clears throat> this is Revere Herald, May 29, 1896. What does he mean, enlightened people? Uh, she speaks about people that understand prophecy. She's talking about people that understand last day events. Because if you don't know what's coming and you are not interested in knowing, you cannot be enlightened to know what needs to be done. You cannot pray for the latter rain if you don't know there is any latter rain. You cannot pray for the Lord to help you. You don't know that. So enlightenment here, connecting that with testimonies to ministers, page 114. Uh, when the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, believers will have an entirely different religious experience. This is what Bible prophecy, as we are doing this studies, this is how we're getting enlightenment about coming future events so that we are ready for, for what is coming. And uh, we, with all our religious advantages, ought to know far more today than we do know. Testimonies Ministers 116. So it's important that we learn not only prophecy, but our doctrines. Because as you'll see in the little time of trouble, we're going to be brought before kings and rulers and to stand to defend our faith before the mighty men of the earth. We need to have the enlightenment. And the enlightenment is also very critical because the latter rain is given to God's people to help them to go and preach. So if you don't have any knowledge of the Bible and the truths of the word of God, why would God give you the Holy Spirit to do what with it? 
There's nothing that the Holy Spirit can bring to your remembrance because you have not been studying, you have neglected study. So it's important that we have an enlightened people. And then you have a victorious people. Um, and that's the next point. The third angel's message is swelling into a loud cry, and you must not feel at liberty to neglect the present duty and shall entertain the idea that at some future time you will be the recipients of uh, the rich blessing. When without any effort on your part, a wonderful revival will take place. This is a deception that many people are looking up to. They're just saying, uh, when the Sunday law comes, somehow our miracles will be spiritual. Spiritual revival starts today with acknowledging your spiritual destitution and beginning to pray for the Lord to come through for you. And having a walk with God now, today you are to have your vessel purified, that it may be ready for the showers of the latter rain. For the latter rain will, will come, and the blessing of God will come upon every soul that is purified from every defilement. It is our work today to yield our souls to Christ, that we may be fitted for the time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord fitted for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is a very important point. That today we should be praying to the Lord to give us victory over the sins that easily beset us. Uh, this was, of course, from Revere Herald, March 22, 1892. And then another statement that I read earlier, those who come to every point and stand every test and overcome, be their prize what it may, have either the counsel of the true witness, they'll receive the latter rain and be fitted for translation. So victorious people. Moving on to the next slide. We have a loving people. We need not only to have victory, we also have to have love. And a lot of people that are speaking victory over sin don't have love. They have coldness, rudeness, but what is needed is loving one another. Testimonies, volume 6, page 42. The spirit can never be poured out while variance and bitterness toward one another are cherished by the members of the church. Envy, jealousy, evil summarizing, and evil speaking of Satan, and they effectually bar the way against the Holy Spirit's work. Okay. So the Holy Spirit will not come upon us when there's so much variance, bitterness, bickering, fighting, as it's happening now. Let Christians put away all dissensions, she says, and give themselves to God for the saving of the lost. Let them ask in faith for the promised blessing, and it will come. The outpouring of the Spirit in the days of the apostles was the former rain, and glorious was the result. But the latter rain will be more abundant. Testimonies, volume 5, page 21. And then, not only loving, but also praying, praying people. Let us with contrite hearts pray most earnestly that, that now, in the time of the latter rain, the showers of grace may fall upon us. Testimonies 590, to ministers 590. It's very important. She says, we need to be praying that, Lord, pour upon me the latter rain. I want to receive the showers of the latter rain. Prepare me for the latter rain. But we need to make it personal. We should pray earnestly in the next paragraph, she says, uh, for the descent of the Holy Spirit as the disciples prayed on the day of Pentecost. If they needed it at that time, we need it more today. Without the Spirit's aid, our efforts to present divine truth will be vain. The Vian Herald, August 25, 1896. Then in the next one, one of my favorite statements, Great Controversy, 621, those who are unwilling to deny self, to agonize before God, to pray long and earnestly for his blessing will not obtain it. Wrestling with God, how few know what it is. How few have ever had their souls drawn out after God with such intensity of desire until every power is on the stretch. When waves of despair, which no language can express, sweep over the supplement, how few cling with unyielding faith to the promises of God. God is going to take us through these experiences. We all test us. The coronavirus is just one of those examples and many other trials I had for God's people to teach us to pray and to trust them. And then the next one, awakening people. When the churches become living, working churches, the Holy Spirit will be given in answer to their sincere request. Then the truth of God's word will be regarded with new interest. 
that will then plead with souls with an earnestness that cannot be repulsed. Then the windows of heaven will be open for the showers of the latter rain. Vivian Herald, February 25, 1890. When we become active in evangelism and we are praying for the latter rain and uh, we are loving people, then the Lord will honor us by granting us the latter rain to continue the work of preaching the gospel. Let's move on to the next one. A temperate people. The next slide, temperate people. And it's very important to explain what temperance is here. She says in Child Guidance 398, true temperance teaches us to dispense entirely with everything hurtful and to use judiciously that which is healthful. There are few who realize as they should how much their habits of diet have to do with their health, their character, their usefulness in this world, and their eternal destiny. The appetite should ever be in subjection to the moral and intellectual powers. The body should be the servant to the mind and not the mind to the body. And then still on this issue of temperance, Ellen White cautions us against um, eating animals, meat and also milk and dairy, um, excuse me, and eggs. These are things that are really affecting us spiritually. I really encourage all of us listening to this class to read the book, Councils on Diets and Food. Um, it's such a powerful book that gives a complete, comprehensive, holistic understanding of uh, these principles of health. I've been instructed that flesh food has a tendency to animalize the nature. That's the first problem of meat. It makes you an animal. To rob men and women of that love and sympathy, which they should feel for everyone. That's very interesting. She says, uh, those who eat meat are robbed of love and sympathy uh, that they need to have for one another. And to give the lower passions control over the higher powers of the being. So it says, when you are partaking a, a lot of flesh food, you have a tendency to have the lower powers controlling the higher powers. If meat eating were ever helpful, it is not safe now. Then she speaks about the health challenges, cancers, tumors, pulmonary diseases are largely caused by meat. But that's not the main point. The main point is its spiritual um, impact and how it really clouds the mind. There's no safety in the eating of the flesh of dead animals. And in a short time, the milk of the cows will also be excluded from the diet of God's commandment, keeping people. In a short time, it will not be safe to use anything that comes from the animal creation. But the Lord will not be trifled with. Distrust, disobedience, alienation from God's will and way will place the sinner in a position where the Lord cannot give him his divine favor. Divine favor here is a reference to the latter reign. So it's important that we exercise true temperance. And uh, in America, you guys have lots of options for vegetarian. And such celebrities and movie artists, uh, people are going vegan now. It's becoming the in thing, but they're doing it for health benefits. How much more of us if we were to do it also for spiritual? And the last one is Sabbath keeping. Uh, Sabbath keeping people. The Sabbath will be such a central uh, issue of controversy, you know, the great war that we are about to face, as you will see when we talk about the seal, is the Sabbath. The question is, as you are at home and you are locked down, you're not able to attend church, are you keeping the Sabbath the right way? This is the time to look up these verses on the slide and see if you understand what is true worship. If you are really struggling to keep the Sabbath now, uh, do you think you'll really keep it in the mountain when you don't have any Bible, when you don't have any spirit prophecy book, when you are shivering and there's no music and things like that? So this is these are areas that really call us for true uh, introspection uh, and self-examination. Exodus 16:23: No cooking, no work to be done on Sabbath, no transportation of goods, no buying or selling, no doing our own pleasure, speaking our own words. These are things that we really need to be praying for the Lord to give us victory over while we still have time of probation. 
and um, I'll stop here now. And I know I said a lot, but um, I hope it makes sense. Just to recap everything, there are two types of rain which represent the two phases of the work of the Holy Spirit. You have the early rain, which represents the work of the Holy Spirit in the uh, in the church from the time of Pentecost even until our time. Uh, it will continue being the early rain time until uh, when the Sunday law passes. After the Sunday law, you have the latter rain. And these two rains are all critical and important. They depend on each other to produce harvest. And the harvest in the Christian sense is going to take place at the second coming. The ripening of the crops represents the duplication of the character of Christ in our hearts and in our minds. And both crops are ripened. You have God's people ripening and also the wicked ripening. When you receive the mark of the beast, you are ripening as a wicked person. In other words, you are bearing the character of Satan in its fullness. When you receive the sin of God, you are bearing the character of Christ in its fullness. In both cases, the world will be ripe for destruction and the other one ripe for salvation. And there are conditions that we need to meet in order for us to receive the latter way and enlightened people. Sabbath keeping people, praying people, and loving people, and all the points that we talk about. May the Lord help us now to be seeking Him daily and praying for the Holy Spirit to come upon us so that we are ready for the crisis that is about to hit this world with an, at an overwhelming surprise. Thank you so much for your time. I don't know whether there are any comments or questions. Yes, uh, it's, it's a very important question that um, you have two faces to that. Um, in Adventism, we have two schools of thought on the sin problem. We have those who believe that sin is part of your nature and you can never overcome it, um, even against what the Bible teaches, even against what the Bible teaches. Uh, they claim the Bible teaches the opposite. Their best is to try and support that. Um, I don't think we, we have time to get into that discussion, but there are several documents that I can send. Uh, people are interested in that study that can be done in that. I believe the Bible teaches um, that the Lord can give us victory over sin. But uh, once we have that victory, we'll always be feeling like we need more of Christ and his likeness. We will never reach a point where we'll say, I'm sinless. Ellen White says that very clearly in sanctified life. And also First John chapter 1 says that very clearly, that if we say we have no sin, we lie. The truth of God is not in us. So it's important that uh, we keep in mind the fact that uh, God is the only one that can give us a purity of character. And that purity of character is the gift of God, his righteousness that we receive by faith and we keep by faith on a day-to-day -day basis. And it is not ours to glorify ourselves with. It is just the work of God's grace in our hearts, Christ transforming us. I mean, when Paul said, um, not that I have reached um, in Philippians chapter 1, Ellen White said about him that the, the record that they had of him in heaven was a different one. Uh, Paul had reached the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Um, and uh, she mentions that he had reached it through the trials, the challenges he went through that brought him very close to Jesus. So it's possible to live a life of victory over sin. And uh, the great controversy is over the sin problem. God is able to help us, but we should not look at ourselves. We should be looking at Christ. And without his help, there's nothing that we can do. We should guard against fanaticism but also God against, uh, God loves us, we don't need to overcome anything kind of mindset. So that is uh, uh, how I would comment on, on, your, on your question. Yes, just before we pray, I just wanted to add that <clears throat> there's a reason why I was impressed to share this class before the little time of trouble and the loud cry. The dear saints have many trials ahead of them that what you're about to study can be very discouraging when you look at what Satan wants to do for the church, against the church to fight it. But there's so much encouragement in the thought that God who's omnipotent, who's powerful, 
is willing to be with us and in each and every one of us to strengthen us through this trial. And our only safety is to make sure that we are one with the Holy Spirit, moment by moment working with Him. And none of us will be lost. Um, so that's what I wanted to say. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your grace. Thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for your presence. That during the time when your church will go through the time of trouble such as never was, you are not going to be in, up in heaven looking down and just waiting for them to go through the trial. You, through the presence of the Holy Spirit in us, will be in us, helping us, fighting the battles for us, giving us victory, encouraging us, strengthening us, and equipping us, giving us words to speak, giving us food to eat, protecting us through this coming crisis. May you help us to understand how much we need you now, even through the coronavirus, and even what will come afterwards. We don't know where this world is going to go after the coronavirus pandemic. You are the only one who knows. And we want to give our lives to you today so that whatever may come, whatever you may allow to happen to us, may be in accordance with your will and for our own good. Bless us and help us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.